All right, let's go ahead and get started on these uh, guided practice problems where we're going to um, talk about how bonds are formed between atoms. And we're going to talk about how ionic bonds are formed, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds are formed. So we're going to do it all in one video here so we can compare how the different bonds are. Um, and we're going to start on page 89. And so we have a lithium atom, all right, which has one valence electron. And then we have a fluorine atom which has seven valence electrons. Now what's going to end up happening is lithium is a metal, it is going to lose its valence electron, fluorine is a nonmetal, and it's going to gain a valence electron. And so I think we can see what's going to happen is this one valence electron is going to be transferred to fluorine. And so the way we, we show that is by drawing an arrow of where the electron is going. And then what ends up happening is we end up with this situation where the lithium is now uh, a one positive and the fluorine is now a one negative. And then what happens is opposites attract. Now what I will say is um, you will see on occasion, or you will see that this is put in brackets. So when ions are formed, you'll see uh, these put in brackets. So moving forward, um, if you see that or you don't see that, that's okay. So let's go ahead and answer this uh, first question here. Uh, would the relative bond strength of this compound be larger or smaller than the bond strength between potassium and bromine? And so what I want you to do is I want you to look at your periodic table and I want you to look at lithium. Uh, lithium is kind of a smaller atom. Take a look at fluorine. Fluorine is also a smaller atom. And that is small compared to um, potassium, which is a larger atom, so this would be potassium and uh, bromine, which is also a larger atom. And so if you think about uh, the fact that the potassium in the, brom the, the bromide, was gonna be bromide, is larger, that means that, that the relative bond strength is um, of lithium and fluorine is gonna be larger, all right? And the reason why is because the distance between these two is greater, all right? So, let me go ahead and, and, and put it in simpler terms. These smaller atoms are able to get closer together, and so they're able, and so the, the uh, force of attraction that is between them is greater. All right, let's go ahead and uh, do this next one here. All right, so we have magnesium, two valence electrons. We have oxygen, six valence electrons. And I want you to sort of anticipate what's gonna happen well, this electron will transfer over, and this electron will transfer over as well. And what we end up with is we end up with magnesium, which is a 2 plus, alone by itself without its uh, valence electrons, and then we get oxygen. That becomes a 2 minus because it gained these electrons. And then opposites attract, and that's how they come together. So again, electrons are transferred. All right, so would the relative bond strength of this compound be larger or smaller than the bond strength between sodium and fluorine? Well, in, the, in, in question one, in this question here, they actually ended, these uh, atoms have the same charge. So this was a one positive, potassium's a one positive. This is a one negative, bromine is a one negative. And so they ended up having the same charges. What was different was the size of the atoms. In this situation, it's, it's actually something different. Magnesium has a two plus, oxygen has a two minus. Compare that to sodium, which has a one plus, and fluorine, which has a one minus. These are larger charges, and so the larger the charge, the stronger the force of attraction. And so in this situation, the magnesium and the oxygen uh, oxide ion are going to have a larger attraction to each other compared to sodium and fluorine because they have a larger charge. So in the first situation, it had to do with the size of the atom. In the second situation, it had to do with the size of the charge. 
And let's go ahead and go to this last one. All right, so this one, um, we have aluminum. Three valence electrons. And then we have chlorine, which has seven valence electrons. Now what ends up happening, again, chlorine's gonna gain one electron here, so it will gain one electron. However, it will only gain one electron. It's only going to gain one electron because it has seven valence electrons, and so it only needs to gain one, but aluminum wants to lose three. So what we end up needing to do is add a couple more chlorines. And what ends up happening is this one transfers here, and this one transfers here. And we end up with the situation where aluminum will make a three positive, and then each chlorine will make a one negative. And you'll see that, uh, again, each one makes a one negative. And so this actually is really similar to what we talked about last unit. Uh, we just really, we're not focused on what the electrons are doing. So again, aluminum has three electrons, three valence electrons, and it'll lose one electron to each chlorine. Now, would the relative bond strength of this compound be larger or smaller than between? Aluminum and sulfur, well, aluminum makes a 3 plus, chloride makes a 1 minus. Compared that to aluminum, which makes a 3 plus, and sulfur, which makes a 2 minus, what will end up happening is this here will have a stronger force of attraction because the charges are larger. So the aluminum obviously has the same charge, but a 2 minus is a greater charge than the 3 plus. So let's go ahead and now move on to covalent compounds. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to um, covalent compounds. Now this is gonna be the practice problems on page 91. And before this, we talked about ionic compounds which transfer electrons, but now we're gonna talk about covalent compounds which share electrons. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like. So if we have a fluorine atom, and fluorine has seven valence electrons. And then we have, uh, let's say this other fluorine atom, and, and it also has seven valence electrons. Each one of these wants to gain an electron. And so one fluorine will not give the other one an electron. So how does this work? Well, what ends up happening is they end up sharing their electrons. And so these electrons end up being shared, and so you end up with something that looks like this, where you have, you have this fluorine now, and then we have this other fluorine, which is here as well. And so you can see this now has eight valence electrons. And so it's, uh, you know, achieved the goal of having eight. And then this one also has eight valence electrons and it has achieved the goal of having eight. And so the way that uh, this works is that each of these single electrons is being shared between the two fluorines. Now, um, a way that we represent this, which I'm gonna write it underneath here, is we represent it like this. And notice how we put a dash here to show a single bond between those two fluorines. All right, so let's go ahead and um, do this next one here, all right? So we have two nitrogen atoms, all right? So we have this nitrogen atom. Now nitrogen has five valence electrons, and when you're doing this, it's always a good idea to kind of orient the um, the the valence or the uh, the single electrons towards the other atom that that you're going to to draw and so what I mean by that is notice how uh, we have this pair of electron here and then the single ones are here and so then we have this nitrogen as well now notice Notice um, in each of these situations, they each want to gain three. 
and uh, just a little hint, it's the single electrons that end up um, participating in the bonding. And so it's the single ones that participate in the bonding. So what ends up happening is these will bond together, these will bond together, and these will bond together. And so those will actually uh, come together, and so we end up with a situation that looks like this, where we have nitrogen, and then we've got our... Um, our pairs there, and then we have this situation here. And each one of these is a bond. And so notice how this actually makes a triple bond. And if you take a look, that's eight valence electrons there, and then this is eight valence electron here. Notice how fluorine makes one bond, because fluorine has one single electron. Notice how nitrogen ends up making three bonds, because nitrogen has three single electrons. And just like above, where we had, uh, we represented the fluorine like this, we're going to go ahead and represent the nitrogen uh, like this. And so each line represents a a uh, pair of electrons. So something that I really want to focus is that notice that each bond here, how many electrons does each each bond represent? Each bond represents three or two electrons. And so each dash is going to mean that it is going to equal two electrons. So how many total electrons are right there? There's a total of six. Now something that I didn't write here, which I'm going to add, and I want you to start adding as well, is that we do want to include what is called lone pairs. And lone pairs are the pairs that are not involved in bonding. All right, so if you see, nitrogen has one lone pair on each nitrogen there. So there we go. Yeah. All right, so now how do you think the general bond length and bond strength compare between the two atoms of fluorine versus the two atoms of nitrogen? What I will say is this one here has a longer bond, this has a longer bond, this one has a shorter bond, and then this one has a uh, smaller bond energy. while this one has a larger energy. And the reason why, all right, the reason why is because single bonds are going to be longer than triple bonds. Single bonds are longer than triple bonds, which makes sense because if there's more bonds, they're, they're gonna be really pulling each other close, closer together. The other thing too is single bonds have a lower energy than triple bonds. All right, let's go ahead and move on to this next one here. So if what if we had two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen, and one atom of carbon? This is going to be um, a little bit more challenging. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a hint. The carbon atom is going to be in the middle. And then we're going to evenly distribute the, the other atoms around it. So what I'll say is both hydrogen atoms will be bonded to the carbon and the oxygen atom will be bonded to the carbon. And so what I'm gonna encourage you to do is pause the video real quick and try to do this one on your own. And if you can't do it, that's totally okay. It's going through the process of attempting it that is where uh, learning occurs. So pause this video. And again, I'm, not, I'm just gonna let you know that carbon is in the middle and I'll even get you started here. And we're gonna have hydrogen and oxygen. And so the hydrogens and the oxygens are, are, surround, are all attached to the carbon. So go ahead and write the valence electrons there and give it your best shot. All right, so um, I just repositioned these, but carbon has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one. And then oxygen has six valence electrons. Now something to keep in mind, it is the single electron that is involved in the bonding. And so you want, so every single electron, all the single ones need to be involved in bonding somehow. And so 
If you take a look, this will bond here, this will bond here, and then notice how, um, so hydrogen does make one bond, and hydrogen will only ever make one bond. Carbon makes four bonds, and then oxygen makes two bonds. So notice how um, there's, so there's two single electrons here, and then there's two single electrons here, so what type of bond do you think will occur there? It's going to be a double bond. And so if we are going to clean this up here, this is how we would clean it up. We would go like this. It's going to be a double bond here with the oxygen. And then we're going to have the hydrogens here with their single bonds like that. Now what I want to point out is notice how, notice these bond angles, which we haven't talked about bond angles, but we will talk about those later. Notice the bond angles here are all about the same, all right? So they should be about the same. So it should be about 120 degrees. And that's because you want to position the atoms that are attached to what is called the central atom. Um, you want to attach, you want to put them to where they're evenly spread out. And so that is the, the molecule that's formed. And so how do you think the general bond length and strength compare uh, between carbon and hydrogen bonds and the carbon and oxygen bonds, how do they compare? Well, um, this is going to be uh, longer and less energy compared to this, which is gonna be shorter and more energy. And the reason why we know that is because this is a double bond, this is a single bond. Double bonds are gonna be shorter and have greater energy to break. It's more energy to break them. All right, now we're gonna move on to the last type of bonding, which is metallic bonding, which is on page 94. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and we're only gonna, we're only gonna do the first two questions. We don't really need to worry about that other one. So explain the following in terms of structure and uh, slash or bonding. So solid potassium conducts an electric current while potassium nitrate does not. Okay, so why would this conduct electricity and this not? Well, the first thing we want to think about is what type of bonds are we dealing with? This is metallic because it's just a metal. And this is ionic. And what we want to think about is what are the electrons doing because because electricity, what electricity is, it's the flow of electrons. And so what I want to do, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write out the explanation and then I'm gonna talk about the explanation. So as you can see here, the electrons in solid potassium are free to move around, meaning that there's able to be a flow of electrons. And so that's why solid potassium is able to conduct electricity. Now think about what the electrons are doing in potassium nitrate. In potassium nitrate, the KNO3, the electrons are completely transferred, and they're transferred from the potassium to the nitrate, and so those electrons are not freely able to move around, but rather they are stuck sort of on the nitrate. And so because they're not able to freely move around, it's not able to conduct electricity. Now for number two, um, which of the following will conduct electric current? This one is the only one that will conduct an electric current. And the reason why that is, is because it's the only one that is a metallic bond. And the explanation is literally the same explanation as above. Now, just a disclaimer, this one will conduct electricity if it is aqueous, if it is in water. And that's something that we will learn in the future. But if you dissolve an ionic compound in water, that is able to conduct electricity. But if it's not dissolved in water, it will not. And that is the sum of all the different types of bond. And so we have ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and metallic bonding. And really the thing you wanna think about is what are the electrons doing in each one? And um, how do those atoms come together to form an octet um, and satisfy their, their valence electron shell. And that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, and you guys have a great day.